In my article last year on the launch of the revised cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power, forward, engaged, ready, or CS21R, I outlined a number of relevant shifts, some in tone, some in substance. Tonight, I'd like to very briefly restate some of the most dominant revisions that I think merit continued observation. And after that recap, I'd like to delve a little deeper into what CS21R means for some non-traditional threats, and particularly where the strategy falls in the broader evolution of conceptualizing maritime security. To start, CS21R speaks to a contemporary audience, one facing notably different challenges than did policymakers in 2007 when the original strategy was launched. Austerity was at the top of that list. From the outset, the Secretary of the Navy in the strategy's preface makes oblique but clear reference to the fiscal constraints that necessarily shape defense policy. And while this, is, while this was a departure in tone from the 2007 strategy, an emphasis on the centrality of budget constraints is now ubiquitous in strategic documents. Sequestration and its implications endure as undercurrents throughout the revised strategy and lend a vastly different tone to the document than its predecessor. Another significant evolution from the original cooperative strategy is the shift from the term Asia-Pacific to the significantly more expansive Indo-Asia-Pacific. With the United States still enmeshed in Middle Eastern conflicts, the implications of this subtle but seismic change in language remain difficult to discern. Nevertheless, the academic in me can't help but underscore the weight of reframing with only the addition of a word, the primary time mari maritime area of interest from that of the Asia Pacific to one that stretches from Somalia through India and Southeast Asia to China and Australia. As a roster of speakers and attendees tonight attests, undoubtedly most of you are better versed in the implications of this than I am, so I won't belabor the point. Other important changes include greater attention paid to Africa, greater emphasis on cyber and the electromagnetic spectrum, and the adoption of a fifth pillar of maritime strategy, all domain access. At the time, I referred to these as above the fold revisions, greater geographical detail, a wider conception of the operating space, and an expansion of what constitutes sea power. I remain, however, pointedly interested in an area that may not have made it above the fold, a marked increase in attention paid to maritime security. I'm speaking here of maritime security with a capital M and a capital S. Some, like the naval historian Jeffrey Till, might consider this terminology a rephrasing of the more conventional good order at sea. Others might file maritime security under the broader category of military operations other than war. There's no real consensus definition for this term as yet. Still, to keep the conversation moving, I'll posit a simple one from a British academic at Lancaster University. Maritime security has to do with illegal and disruptive human activities in the littorals. Whatever you call it and however you define it, maritime security is evidently gaining momentum as a distinct subfield of naval strategy. As you've no doubt noticed, maritime security has been a growing subheading in strategy documents out of DOD for years, crystallized in the revised cooperative strategy. References to countering human trafficking, for example, can be found in CS21R, whereas there were none in the 2007 iteration. The first section of the revised edition, which details changes in strategic considerations since the publication of the original strategy, is interspersed with references to terrorism, transnational organized crime, population growth in the littorals, and instability of undergoverned spaces ashore. These elements, while far from groundbreaking, elevated maritime security to a place of relative prominence in the document and, more importantly, present a refreshingly nuanced vision of what maritime security means for sea power. I should, however, put this into context. As I mentioned, maritime security has for the last several years emerged sporadically across strategic documents. Take, for example, the 2008 National Defense Strategy with references to the threats and obstacles posed by non-state actors, undergoverned territories, transnational organized crime, and population growth. Or take the National Maritime Strategy, which likewise references population growth, non-state actors, and the role of traffickers in the movement of terrorists and arms. The list doesn't end there. The 2014 QDR, Naval Doctrinal Publication 1, Naval Operational Concepts 2010 all speak to varying degrees to these types of maritime security issues. There is also the 2005 National Strategy for Maritime Security, which, as you might discern from its name, is more of a homeland security document than a strategy for security in foreign littorals. Amid all this, the revised cooperative strategy is a continuation of a broadening trend in incorporating maritime security into long-term policy planning. 
Still, there's a long way to go to make strategizing on maritime security equal in vision and comprehensiveness to that of the other pillars of sea power outlined in the tri-service strategy. More often than not, maritime security is simply whatever doesn't fit elsewhere, just an agglomeration of semi-autonomous missions. And the reasons for this are twofold, and I've pulled some data from my research to help illustrate the point. First, there's the atomized and often bureaucratized approach to maritime security. This stovepiped perspective is enduring because strategists and academics alike, in the words of David Kilcullen, tend to prefer theories of conflict framed around a single threat, be it insurgency, terrorism, piracy, or human trafficking. The implications of this approach are consequently often narrowly framed, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, counterpiracy, and so on. Intuitively, we understand that the maritime services face a multitude of threats simultaneously, but strategies of maritime security have been slow to unite these disparate missions under one coherent vision of what maritime security means. This leads me to the second major obstacle to a still more coherent vision of maritime security, the relative newness of it all. Maritime security grew as a field of study largely in tandem with the exponential rise in terrorism research after September 11th. The British academic Basil German notes that before 2002, the phrase maritime security was all but non-existent in the academic literature. Out of more than 16,000 Google Scholar hits, only about 200 were penned between 1914 and 1988. From 2002, the use of the phrase has grown linearly. Newness is also reflected in the international strategic literature. NATO became the first major inter intergovernmental organization to publish a maritime strategy document only in March 2011. While it touches on many of the things noted in the revised cooperative strategy, piracy, terrorism, and transnational organized crime, for example, NATO never actually defines what it means by the terms maritime environment or maritime security, which perhaps suggests that member countries may have failed to reach a deeper agreement on what these terms signify. One year later, the African Union set out its own agenda in 2050, Africa's integrated maritime strategy. The AU's strategy is sensibly focused on rectifying the continent's ongoing struggle with establishing maritime domain awareness. Yet more than anything else, the dominant impression is that it's more of a wish list than a strategy. The AU acknowledges the continent's maritime porosity, but requires too much of a fundamental investment in capacity building to implement any comprehensive approach. Finally, the EU published the European Union Maritime Security Strategy just in June 2014. While the strategy succeeds in presenting many employable proposals, the EU tension between interoperability and sovereignty remains an undercurrent throughout the text. One can only imagine how the ongoing migrant crisis has stressed this even more. Massive coastal urbanization in the former third world will only further complicate access and operations in the littorals. Climate change will produce more frequent and more debilitating disasters in regions already struggling with social upheaval. Pollution and illegal fishing will continue to drive some to piracy in waterways that are only getting more crowded. While the responsibility of the United States to armed forces is and will remain to prevent and if need be win large conventional conflicts, the growing presence of maritime security within strategy documents like CS21R suggests that the maritime services are slowly but surely signaling a genuine realignment with more geopolitical changes than just a rising China or a roguish Russia. In closing, I'll summarize as I did in my article. In many of the most significant ways, a cooperative strategy for 21st century sea power, forward, engaged, ready, is not so much a revision, but a replacement of its 2007 incarnation. Longer, more detailed, more expansive, and more inclusive, the revised document builds heartily on the framework established nine years ago, the results being a work distinctly different in both tone and content. While greater attention will no doubt be paid to many of these differences, equally important is perhaps subtler changes were made regarding how the maritime services face non-state issues, including the illicit traffic in people, narcotics, and weapons. As CS21R continues the tropes increasingly familiar in strategy documents, budget uncertainty, evolving threat complexity, a shift towards the Asia Pacific, it brings the maritime services into a more nu nuanced, if perhaps ambitious vision of what sea power will mean in the future. Thank you. Audience? No.
when you brought up your point about uh, the use of security. I know in a lot of uh, European academics and literature, they use security as we would use for defense or a broader concept. Do you think that's why we're seeing more of it? Is it really a conscious effort or is it just another way, a, a newer way of saying the same old stuff? Sure. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it's a conscious effort globally across, you know, either the European security establishment or, or European academia, there are importantly also other connections to the use of, of the word security, particularly in European literature. The fact that security has been used as a much broader concept to include human security, food security, things of that nature. So that in all likelihood is tied to, you know, just the growing expansion of what security encompasses is probably a large part of that. But I would say that, that there is a distinct, if perhaps not conscious movement towards the, the particular coupling of the phrase maritime security, especially in the academic literature, to signify something very specific, particularly the activity of non-state actors in littorals. I, I, I would say that, that that's shaping up as, as a distinct subfield in its own right. And while in many respects, and in a lot of U.S. strategic documents, maritime security isn't used quite so exactingly, uh, I would say, more broadly speaking, it, we're driving towards some sort of coherent understanding that that is a unique subfield as set aside from maybe more broadly naval strategy. Thanks. Uh, great talk. And just wanted to uh, add some granularity to some of the uh, maritime security aspects that you're talking about, one in the Mediterranean and one in West Africa. As we're seeing with the European uh, mass migration crisis, the European Border Control Agency Frontex, their sea borders sector, which is tasked with uh, exactly that, uh, maintaining the integrity of the uh, external borders of the European Union. For years, they have been running into all sorts of illicit transnational maritime activity beyond regular migration. And it's those organized criminal networks, the transnational organized crime syndicates, that uh, they run into counterfeit money, drugs, fish, body parts. And uh, you look no further than the uh, Paris attacks and seeing the ability for bad actors to enter undocumented uh, into the EU. And then uh, going over to West Africa, uh, the U.S. military, uh, AFRICOM, uh, tries to support its African partners uh, several years ago looking at uh, what they needed to do to enforce their laws in the maritime domain. And, and I think we were thinking the United States more along the drug flow coming from the source zone over in South America to West Africa and into Europe. And uh, there was a program, a law enforcement program that uh, DOD partners with the Coast Guard to uh, embark African boarding teams to go after drugs. After the first year and evolution of that, what became very clear from our African partners was while they don't like drugs, they really don't like the illegal fishing uh, that goes on in their territory, the marine pollution, and, and it takes away a whole lot of money from their, uh, either they lose the uh, they don't have that ability to collect the fishing revenue. It's underemployment or unemployment among their workforce, the fishers and uh, the fishermen. And then lastly, it becomes a food security issue when some of these countries, the majority of their protein comes from the, the sea. And that, in fact, has led to mass migration from some of these countries to the EU. So uh, it all kind of boils back to uh, transnational organized crime and uh, – it's good to see that some of this is being, you know, addressed in broader terms. The Defense Department is looking at, at this as well, where it may have been a constabulary uh, Coast Guard police function right. in the past. It's, it's bigger than that. No, I, I completely agree, and I think two, two major takeaways from, from that comment, I think. Uh, the first is the idea that you, you see in the in the example of, from West Africa that you presented the threat of looking at single threat streams, right? If and we are, are very guilty of that, is is we'll come in and we'll say you have a a drug running problem. We're gonna we're gonna focus on the drug running problem, but in reality, those are all the same networks, right? And those aren't necessarily even the same threat spectrums that are of concern to the local partners. And so, without a broader understanding of how 
the counter narcotics fits in with counter IUU fishing and irregular migration, you're, you're inherently only looking at one very small portion of a much larger network. I think the second point in, in there that, that you rightly touched on is the fact that, yeah, this, this was, and it still often is portrayed as largely a constabulary action. That's most where you see a, the value of the tri-service strategy and not just a Department of the Navy strategy. The fact that, that, that this is Coast Guard's bread and butter, and while they largely do that in the Caribbean, as you mentioned, they are all over the world with these sorts of operations. They do partnerships and lead at detachments all over the world, Southeast Asia, West Africa, where have you. So I think having the Coast Guard as part of this conversation helps drive the narrative towards a much broader understanding of the real geopolitical and geostrategic implications of transnational organized crime and that, how that could have real reverberating implications in the broader strategic landscape. I have a question. Um, thank you for your presentation. Outside of U.S. national security documents and trends in our services, what do you see in the private world in maritime security in the future, in, in, in parallel with this? Sure. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be purport to be an expert on uh, private maritime security companies. All, all I can say is at the moment, it seems to be in some respects a boon industry. Uh, there are certain regions that seem to be either partnering with or restricting some restrictions on that sector. Uh, I think the, the first person who presented noted that you can never know the future. I mean, all it takes is one incident in, in someone's territorial waters and all of a sudden the landscape has changed entirely. I will say, though, as we as we raise consciousness of the broader implications of maritime security issues, as I've described them as these transnational criminal issues and the IUU fishing, that that consciousness is being raised for a reason. The fact, I mean, IUU fishing in certain, maybe not off the coast of Argentina, but in certain parts of, of West Africa or Southeast Asia has the potential to, to, to mushroom into, into a full-blown regional conflagration because you've got not just, as you're talking about, these militias involved, but you have coast guards and navies involved with sinking other people's vessels. And so I think in that regard, it's worth paying attention to how that will affect the, the private market. I'm not sure, but one would suspect that it seems like a growth industry. I think Claude could probably speak to that a little bit more uh, if you want to get with him uh, after as well. Um, but the, yeah, this is a fascinating uh, topic, and, and thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, you know, obviously, as we have maritime security in the name of our uh, organization, um, it is the sort of terminology uh, debate is is one of interest. I take personally a little bit more of a you know, like the expansive view, less of the narrowing with, uh, I guess, a little, a lowercase M and S and taking a literal sort of, you know, this, all the types of security right. dimensions um, from the naval to um, food and environmental and uh, economic uh, types of security. But you do a great job of uh, explaining and, and pointing out the interconnectedness of those different types of uh, threats and challenges and the solutions that might be uh, found to deal with them. I did receive a, a, a breaking uh, news bulletin from uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Andrew Erickson, who wanted to let you all know that there are copies of the Naval War College uh, review up here for the taking. So after we finish with our last uh, presentation, feel free to stop by and, and get some great literature here. Uh, and with that, I, I thank you, Josh. Thank you.